Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the generous introduction. Uh, very rarely do I start my day looking at the video of myself. Um, so I think I'm going to remember this day, and Lawrence, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm sure we're all headed for a very interesting uh, day ahead, and uh, personally for me, I'm, I'm uh, happy about today for a couple of reasons. One, my fundamental belief has always been a concept called sisterhood. And uh, Bidisha reached out to me this morning and we had a very interesting conversation. And it reminded me of sisterhood, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, I think the second bit is my colleagues, whom we call as greaters and great place to work. So I'm joined uh, by Anoop. Uh, Anoop, if you can say a quick hi. Uh, he heads our director, uh, he, he's a director for the consulting practice and um, um, you know I was keen that he joins us because um, he's had some amazing roles in the space of retail, uh, be it pizzas or Starbucks or anything like that. So I think he understands this space so well. I'm joined by Geetanjali who heads our brand and marketing and I think the, the positioning of uh, the retail industry. You're headed for exciting times. And I, uh, Lauren shared with me this morning that the, the dry kind of 25 lakh voices. So I think it'll be our uh, endeavor in great place to work also to take that message forward. And Zeal, uh, who heads our uh, culture and audit practice, and she's privy to some of the best practices and what I call as next practices that is emerging in the industry. So thank you guys for joining me. Uh, coming back to the theme, I don't know who set the theme for the RAI summit, but isn't it so topical? Um, RRR to a South Indian is a very special term, right? Uh, we were just at the Golden Globes um, and we just met with Steve, uh, Steven Spielberg. So for me, when I heard R, R and R, I'm like, you guys got it right, uh, right? Uh, let me dwell through and I think I was uh, kind of told to talk about my journey and uh, it kind of fit the theme, which is reimagine, reinvent and reevaluate. Um, let me take the first one of reimagine. And I think through my whatever, 20, 24 years of my career at the trade, I have always faced three types of biases. One is an age bias. Because my first um, business was 14 years ago and I started with management consulting. And consulting, as you know, is a grey head job. And there I was 20 something. Uh, participating in the boardrooms and talking. So I always used to struggle the first 10 minutes because, you know, we all judge, don't we? Uh, so that was a struggle. So one is the age bias. And I think while it's glamorous for us to look at, at a career like this um, and saying that she broke so many stereotypes and glass ceilings, it also comes with it a feeling of isolation, feeling alone. Because if you look around, there are not too many peers that you can sit down and have a conversation with, right? So I always, my heart goes out to the so-called young achievers because we are so young and we're so impressionable. And when we look around, you know, it is a lonely life. So we learn very early on to become our own best friends. And for me, um, I always uh, had a sense of duty. Um, I'm a very proud citizen of the country. My colleagues are probably tired of hearing it every single day, but I always have believed in the, the term called why us and why now? And even if you look at the way India is being positioned on the global economic scale, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us do international travels. The way you're treated at customs has changed to what it was 15 years ago. Uh, today, India is being spoken about. There is pride at a global level. And the industry that all of you represent 
is a game changer. Uh, so you're sitting in an industry which can really be a game changer for our economy. So I would urge each and every one of you to not only think about your jobs, think about your company, but do think about the industry as well. And do think about the influence that you can actually add to the policy making, right? Uh, you know, I have always kind of, how do I say it? If somebody said that this is an accepted norm and this is the path for you to follow, I never did that. Um, so I remember what my father uh, says always. He says, Yashaswani, there's a very thin line between bravery and foolishness. You know, choose wisely. And uh, if, if I look back, I think uh, I have no regrets. Um, you know, you're in a top multinational company, two levels below the CHRO in your late 20s. You leave everything away to start your own company. Um, and, and that time startup was not sexy. Today, everybody is talking about valuations and everything. But, you know, 15 years ago, they thought you probably lost a job and then you wanted to be an entrepreneur, right? So I think for me, I've always had the courage to imagine or probably reimagine if that is the theme of uh, my career. And I've looked at my career not as a sequential journey. I've looked at my career as a career portfolio. What is it that I can gather along the way that when I write my own chapter, it is mine to write, right? From a reinvention standpoint, um, I think, um, and that's applicable for all of us as well, as to what are the skills that we're picking up along the way? Um, you know, and I learned it, um, this year uh, to say that motivation is like a seasonal flu. It comes and it goes. What stays with you is knowledge, skills and ability. So what is it that we're doing as professionals to really invest back with us? You know, passion is good. Everybody talks about passion. We talk about, uh, you know, if you have passion, you win the world uh, well, but it rains also. Right. So motivation is like a seasonal flu. What ke keeps you afloat is that substance. And I think I would really encourage you to think beyond and break those stereotypes. Uh, for me, I started off as an HR professional um, because I loved people. Um, and I always believe that organizations are catalysts for you to write your own chapter. I don't think an organization, at least that's the way I've looked at it. I've never looked at an organization as, as a, a set of people with rules and regulations of a fast track career of a normal, you know, these are all jargons for me. I've always looked at, at an organization as a catalyst to what I want to enjoy every day. And if I don't enjoy and I'm not my authentic mm -hmm. self, uh, you will see it in my body language and you will see it uh, in me. I don't know of any other way to be other than myself. Um, is it easy? Of course not. <laughs> but, you know, that gives you the resilience to carry on. And from an HR, I quickly jumped to venture capital and portfolio management, um, right? And... Um, um, you know, from people, I went into numbers. I went into signing checks for startups. And at one point in time, I was managing a portfolio of 46 companies. Uh, so, you know, so we would have said no to about 2000 business plans. And in these 46 companies as a portfolio manager for startups, you have to exit a few. You have to reinvest in a few. You have to close down a few. And the closing down is always heartbreaking. Because telling an entrepreneur to say, buddy, your time is up. I know these were your hopes and aspirations, but we don't see the runway. That's always a tough conversation. And, you know, that taught me a lot. And the third is that of a serial entrepreneur, right? So if you look at the journey, maybe a takeaway could be um, the courage to actually reinvent to reimagine and reinvent from an HR to a, a portfolio manager and investor in startups to a, a serial entrepreneur. I think 
um, there was this story of a frog in, a, in the well. I don't know whether you've heard about it. If you've heard about it, pardon me for boring you. Um, but, uh, you know, there is this story of a frog uh, which unfortunately fell into the well. And the well was very deep. And uh, it kind of looked up and it said, how do I uh, jump? And then it looked up and it had other friends that were there. And it said, you know, help me come out of the well, help me and all of that. And then all that the frog could see was just a lot of chatter. Chatter, 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 not really no rope that is being, <laughs> you know, given, etc. So then the frog thought and said, I have hands and legs, you know, I can possibly trust myself. So let me do something. And then it, it thought about a plan. Then it started climbing up. And as and when it was climbing up, the chatter that the frog saw of its friends, the chatter started decreasing. So the frog is wondering to say, you know, what's happening, right? And finally, the frog came out of the well. Um, and then there was this other animal. I don't know what animal you like. I'm a big fan of Panchatantra, so uh, it teaches you a lot, right? Um, so let's call it, I don't know, dog. <laughs> so there's this dog nearby and the dog goes up to this frog and says, you've done something impossible, right? Uh, how did you manage to do it? And then the frog turns around and says, I can't listen to what you're saying. What are you saying? I'm deaf. Then the dog is like completely shocked and said, oh my God, you're deaf. So, so then they get into the sign language and they say, how did you manage to climb? And the frog says, well, I looked up to my friends and they were saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Uh, you know, and that gave me the motivation and courage. And the dog was completely shocked because the dog could hear. And all it could hear was the friend saying, sorry, buddy, you've fallen into the well. We can't help you. Stay there, stay there. You know, uh, and, and every time the frog made progress, the chatter reduced because the cynicism was giving way into something that they didn't know what to do. So sometimes, even as business entrepreneurs, I keep saying this. If you have to be a path breaker and you sit down and ask for advice, it's good. But then you're breaking a path. So that path never existed. So what are you seeking advice on? So it's very applicable for entrepreneurs. It's equally ap applicable for high potential employees. If you want to be a path breaker, you should have the wisdom and the courage to do something um, which is path breaking. Um, right. Um, so you should listen, but don't fall into the trap of seeking self-validation because if you're so open to what others say about you uh, you will have a tendency to get lost and you will have a tendency to develop a sense of ego which is like a peak in valley when people praise you you will feel very happy and when people don't praise you you will you know so you're giving away control of your emotions, of your sense of identity to a community that you have no control over. And, you know, I have, I've learned it the hard way. The third is to re-evaluate. And I think, and after this, I have a few slides that I, I will share with you. I think on the re-evaluate bit, um, be extremely self-critical. You know, sometimes we get lazy. Uh, and sometimes we get scared to really re-evaluate where we are in life. Because sometimes we, were, we would have got so comfortable with a designation, with a pay package, with what we're doing in life, that we may know that we're not living to our potential, but are we really listening to that? So I, again, it takes a lot of self-honesty for you to um, re-evaluate. And sometimes, um, if you feel that you're not enjoying, um, you shouldn't be doing that. So 
the last thing I want is somebody to, to say that I increase attrition in the industry. That's not why I'm saying this. <laughs> All that I'm saying is that your life matters. Uh, believe in that. I think sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit. All of us are unique and believe me, your voice matters, your life matters. And there's no excuse for all of us to become old, grumpy, uh, lying on a bed uh, with less physical ability to move around and say, Shayad, us zamane mein mene ye kiya hota. And this is Mumbai, so all the Bollywood dialogues you guys will know better than me uh, as to what to say. But why would you want to end your life with regrets? It's okay. Uh, you know, you do you. Do you and be extremely proud of it. Um, with that, if I can request, I had shared an AV of uh, Amitabh Bachchan. All of us know Amitabh Bachchan. And I thought I'm coming to Mumbai and I'm addressing an audience such as yours. And um, with the standing noise, um, you know, I cannot not share with you Amitabh Bachchan, right? So if you remember, India finished its 60 years of independence and uh, there was a video released by the Times which spoke about the dualities of Bharat and India. And I thought that was very relevant for us here. So can I request the AV team to kind of uh, bring that up, please? There are two Indias in this country. One India is training at the leash, eager to spring forth and live up to all the adjectives that the world has been recently shouting about. The other India is the leash. One India says, give me a chance and I'll prove myself. The other India says, prove yourself first and maybe then you'll have a chance. One India lives in the optimism of our hearts. The other India lurks in the skepticism of our minds. One India wants, the other India hopes. One India leads, the other India follows. These conversions are on the rise. With each passing day, more and more people from the other India are coming over to this side. And quietly, while the world is not looking, a pulsating, dynamic new India is emerging. An India whose faith in success is far greater than its fear of failure. An India that no longer boycotts foreign-made goods, but buys out the companies that make them instead. History, they say, is a bad motorist. It rarely ever signals its intentions when it's taking a turn. This is that rarely ever moment. History is turning a page. For over half a century, our nation has sprung, stumbled, run, fallen, rolled over, got up and dusted herself, and cantered, sometimes that on. But now, in our 60th year as free nation, the ride has brought us to the edge of time's great precipice. And one India, a tiny little voice in the back of the head, is looking down at the bottom of the ravine and hesitating. The other India is looking up at the sky and saying, it's time to fly. Well, I think he deserves a bigger round of applause, if, if I may please request you to do that. But thank you, thank you. But this resonates on so many levels, isn't it? And personally, my personal takeaway is the statement saying, um, my hope of success is bigger than my fear of failure. And I think even as business owners, even as entrepreneurs, even as career enthusiasts that we are all, I think for me, that is the takeaway because if you've not ventured, you've not done it. And if you've not done it, you've not learned anything. And if you've not learned anything, you're not improving. And if you're not improving and learning and refining your journey as you go along, you're definitely not R, R and R, which is the theme of today, right? So it, it, it's okay, you know, something that's permanent 
is life and death. Everything in between is our ability to create it. Uh, of course, there is a dialogue to say destiny versus free will or, uh, you know, if everything is written for us, what do we do? And that's a large part of why our country remains peaceful and non-litigant. Is because when something happens, we say, Tumhara karmi tha. We don't go and seek justice. So maybe, but that's a different conversation of how we've used religion to manage societies. I'm digressing. But uh, my point is that there is this contradiction in our country where they say, prove yourself and then I'll give you a chance. And then there is this other side, which is the new India, which is saying, give me a chance. I want to do a startup. This is my new age idea. And then I'll prove to you. And Bangalore, my friends, has been a great testament to that. We are a startup capital of India today for a reason. I mean, the joke is you, you throw a stone and you will find a, a founder, entrepreneur kind of stuff. But the culture of the city is such that it took the alternative, which is take a chance and let's see. And aren't you all proud that today our country has the highest number of unicorns? You know, we touched 100. The value creation that we've had has been amazing. Of course, the fundamentals of business and being an entrepreneur, I have to be true to it. They have to be cash positive. So it is very interesting to see how many of them will survive. But coming back to the work culture, which is what I was getting at, and if we could have the slide up, please, the slide deck that I had shared, you would see something very interesting, especially in these unicorns. And now in Bangalore, it's not unicorn. They use another word which starts with T, but I'm forgetting it. You know, it's, it's like unicorn is done, the next level, right? So kind of jobs that have been created, the kind of wealth that has been created has been amazing. And from a work culture standpoint, because that's my expertise and that's my organization's expertise, um, at the center, we have seen authenticity. There is absolute commitment by the founders and by the CEO to make things happen, to take those bold decisions. And I'm often asked this question saying, Ye bolne mein acha hai. Be an authentic leader, be true to yourself, be empathetic, be less number driven, paisa bana liya to theek hai, etc, etc, right? But how do you actually practice it? And practice it in a way that you have to role model it. Because if you're a leader, you cannot be ambivalent. You, you need to take a position of a zero or a hundred. You can't say, hum ye bhi karte hain, shayad hum ye bhi karte hain. Decision making is a key skill. So there is always a need for you to go zero to hundred. You need to take a stand. It's a yes or, or it's a no. And I come back to what I'm saying. You have to be true to yourself. So how do you actually practice authentic leadership? And for me, it's a very simple formula that thanks to Hubert Jolly, uh, he's a Harvard prof and the ex-CEO of uh, Best Buy. Again, in the retail space, uh, you would know about Best Buy and their fantastic case study of a turnaround. And what he says is extremely um, sensible. He says authentic leadership is honesty because you have to be honest minus self-righteousness because that is where the bias comes in, isn't it? Right? Uh, or maybe you're a first generation graduate. So you chill. I have a pedigree that, you know. So minus self-righteousness, honesty, minus self-righteousness, plus vulnerability. I think the pandemic has taught us that. We don't have answers to everything today. And it's okay to admit that we don't have answers as long as you're committed to making the change happen. Yeah. And that if practiced at a consistency that is visible, will make you the leader for tomorrow. So today, the, the, the problem, at least at the board level, is not about how we're going to survive today. I think there is enough knowledge and competence at the boardrooms. The question is, how do we future proof our companies? 
there is global uncertainty the war is still happening uh, energy crisis is here to stay so the impact on your supply chain management is going to be huge you're going to be having a huge fluctuation uh, in in your pricing so there's a lot of uncertainty as we speak so the question is not how do we survive today question is how do we future proof our companies and the answer to that lies in creating a workplace culture where your employees have the confidence of being the best version of themselves i was just talking about that a couple of days ago and when i was sharing that there was a lot of cynicism in the group that i was addressing it to to say you know you must be joking we have our bosses to pander to uh, you know and we have the organization politics to kind of navigate and how you're saying uh, you know let's be a culture where you are the best version of yourself and i have always believed that an entrepreneur is an is a eternal optimist if we are not we can't survive because we bet on the future we bet on the possibility and that's what makes us us and i would really encourage you to take that hope back to your workforce you have to just give them that encouragement and that safety net that when they make mistakes it's okay and that my friends works wonders so i know i have a limitation of time so i'm going to be skimming through this and this is all zeal and anoop magic which is why i'm grateful that they here i think the year 22 has been an amazing year because you see the pre pandemic we were very physical in our work environments and in the pandemic we became almost virtual or fully virtual in some industries and the post pandemic we've now moved to what we call and know as a hybrid work environment now the hybrid work environment is even more challenging than all virtual all virtual was a level playing field all of us logged in from home there was no this generation lingo called fomo now if you take a survey the employees working from home have a very high fomo of what's actually happening in the office right so the hybrid work environment is going to throw us challenges that we've not experienced so conversations around bias conversations around you know having an intentional collaborative culture where as a leader as a manager you promote collaboration intentionally i think all the softer aspects of what makes a leader other than financial acumen that is going to be uh, what is called for from leaders today so i i'm not going to read through this these slides are pretty self explanatory uh, but i have no doubt when i share with you that 2022 has been a year of the melting pot when it comes to cultures there are essential companies like power we all worked from home but we had power that's because a set of employees were going to the power plant they were not staying at home even when there was fear of a covid or a pandemic they were said buddy report to work right and then there was the other the luxury brands which completely shut down and you know what is interesting is the last two years of the pandemic employees have joined and left the organization without even coming to the office now just 3 years ago if somebody told you that aisa kuch hone wala hai you know you would probably say shayad aapka alcohol thoda zyada ho gaya hai come let's you know so just look at the world that we are living in i mean a lot of things have changed permanently right um i think the journey for us in india has been fascinating so for people who don't know about great place to work we're a global authority we say we're a global authority because we have employee voices from over 150 countries across the world and more than 10000 organizations participate with us annually so our access to employee voices is the highest and we we enjoy the world's largest market share 
uh, in workplace culture. So we're actually able to see India versus the rest of the world. And like I shared 10 minutes earlier, I'm a very proud Indian. And this kind of data gives me that uh, thing because the kind of compassion our leaders have shown, the kind of community thinking where vaccine was for the employee and their families. You know, some of the uh, decisions that have been taken during the pandemic, I think India stands very, very high when you look at some of those global benchmarks. And we have moved closer to a more impartial, collaborative, fair and a caring place to work as a country. So I think we're doing something right. And we should pat ourselves on the back that, you know, we may be called as a culture of jugaad, we may be called as a culture of shortcuts. In Canada, we say, adjust muddy. You know, it's, it's fine, you carry on. But I think fundamentally, uh, we have the right uh, ethos uh, with us as leaders. These are some of the trends that you would see from 2016 uh, onwards to 22, where the red line is the grand mean and the, the, the black one is just one statement saying, of course, you have your policies, you have your compensation, you have your bean bags, you have a food court, all of that, all of that given. But taking everything in into account, do you feel you're a great place to work? And you see that has been rising. Um, it's a pretty complicated chart but again self-explanatory where again you look at the time trajectory and what's interesting is encouraging work-life balance because I think before the pandemic we went to office during the pandemic the office came home so if I was living in a complicated personal life like you know I work a lot with NGOs as you would have seen in my introduction and I must tell you for Bangalore, the number of domestic violence cases shot up by 300%. Because you know what, before the husband used to get drunk and he used to go. Abhi aap bol ra, sab ghar mein ho. Kya karega? I have had some of my companies that I work with, some of the clients calling me up and saying, a few ladies called and said, Give, get me that exception pass. I want to come to office. And they said, no, we can't. The government has, you know, Modi ji came in March and said, please be at home. Modi ji comes and says demonetization. So whenever Modi ji comes, we're a little, you know, kya hone wala hai. But, you know, where will that lady go? And th this lady was made to sleep in the kitchen. That is the reality and she, and she said, I'm going to commit suicide. I can't do this because there was complete uncertainty. And I remember sending an email to my employee saying, just for a couple of weeks, and then all of you are going to come back. We Little did we know that this is going to go for two years, right? So, I mean, so the pandemic has really shown us a mirror in the face. While we have stories about compassion and all of that, we've, we've also had stories about the societal structures which which needs to change um, and and the lack of logistics and infrastructure i've had a personal uh, loss a death happened in my family during the pandemic and we were at a loss because there was no space uh, to burn the body uh, so i think we've lived through tough times and coming back to work-life balance i think it's so key because the work has come home so the environment has changed so before we used to apologize, I'm, I may be getting very deep and serious, so I'll bring in humor, you know. Before we used to apologize, of course, as an entrepreneur, my biggest uh, regret is that I did not register a trademark called Please Unmute Yourself. If I had a trademark, I would have been a billionaire by now. Sorry, I'm on mute, etc. So I think, you know, what started of us apologizing when the pressure cooker went on or when the doorbell rang, we were very apologetic. We say, excuse me, and you know, and now it's become normal, right? So the concept of work-life balance has also changed. It's not about meditation. It's not about yoga. It's about how can you be you? 
in an environment in your home where you still have to be productive where you still have to face those dreaded appraisals where you still have to be promoted in an environment that has changed forever and and that is that is an interesting thing so what's what's in it for us for 2023 what should we focus on i think two main things fairness at workplace be equitable right so there are some policies for this segment but not the other segment so fairness is being questioned and credibility of management walk the talk literally walk the talk and the reputation is not in your hands anymore you see any one of your employee can go on a tiktok or a twitter or something and say my management sucks and god forbid if it goes viral which it can then all your policies and all your thing one side but then you're left justifying right so credibility of management is center stage people want you to be uh, authentic people want you to walk the talk i think the tolerance for saying bigger big things and not following through at least the millennials are not in for it and i just recently wrote an article of gen alpha so for those who are uninitiated we had gen z that we spoke a lot about then came this whole millennial millennial thing and now we're talking gen alpha because z ho gaya na z ho gaya so as consultants we have to introduce a new terminology so we started with alpha and then we'll have the beta god knows but again if you study the alpha generation which is the future workforce i mean you won't even believe that they're from the same family i mean the generation gap is is so high um for india i think it's about inclusion we've spoken about it it's 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 you know as cliche as it may sound um inviting people to the party and ensuring you've invited male female that is diversity but asking them to dance is inclusion and belongingness and i take that conversation a bit forward and say invest in equity don't stop at inclusion you know it's like equity is you are individualizing or customizing a policy that best suits the employee so it's like you know you've called for uh, an evening with all your employees and you decide to show a horror movie now some of them may not even like a horror movie but you're saying mai to movie dikha raha hu it doesn't work so equity is a future skill um and as lnd practitioners this time is absolutely ripe for you in the next 5 years if we don't see innovative practices emerging from the retail industry from the lnd space you have missed the boat please be very aware of that because the time for you is now because everything is being rewritten on the drawing board um a little more statistics on that uh I guess that's it. Um so I think to summarize this technology is here to stay. Uh, the quicker we adopt it and the quicker we customize and individualize it uh to a need or to a competency which makes your company future ready rather than dealing with current and do take a look at your appraisal systems because if you've finished an appraisal for the last quarter or for the last year you're analyzing you're already dealing with historic data the business has changed the business has moved on so what are the lag indicators and what are the lead indicators that as practitioners you're dealing with on a daily basis to take those decisions i think that becomes paramount so thank you so much for having me over I hope I got a glimpse of workplace culture. I gave you a glimpse of uh, what you can be. Um if you say if you stay true to your dreams, um you definitely get a lot of love. You get a lot of appreciation. Um but the journey is a hard one. Uh and and like
I'm in a Bollywood mood today. Like Salman Khan's ad says, right? Dar ke aage jeet hai. So on that jeet note, uh, let me let me stop here. But have a wonderful rest of the day, my friends. Thank you.